last uh, last session of the day and tomorrow one more day to go so hang on you're getting you're getting there i feel like we should make t-shirts I, I survived the summer school of religion and you're right but not there yet uh, still uh, in a very interesting session to come um, focusing on, on race state speech and, and i uh, very happy to introduce dave david keen um and uh, dear dear friends so roja myself and dave we're all at the same Center, the Irish Center for Human Rights, to take our uh, to take our PhD. So uh, either it's a small world, or we keep this very much within the family. <laughs> a bit of nepotism going on. Uh, Dave, well, you all have his uh, his CV. He's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, expert on um, on ICERs. Also, a big expert on caste-based discrimination, uh, racial discrimination, uh, many other aspects of international human human rights law. Uh, publishing fiercely in the area of, uh, of ICERT, um, very important book also on caste-based discrimination and a collection also on, uh, on, on, on ICERT, uh, tons of additional stuff outside of that, uh, that area within the wide international human rights law. And it's a pleasure to have you. If you're all thanks, own really appreciate it. Um, it's lovely to be here. So thanks, own Thanks, Ruja, for the invitation and to uh, Trinity College and the school as well and so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm aware that you are all from, I haven't been here all week, but I'm aware that you're all from you know certain different backgrounds etc but um, I will hopefully uh, not go too quickly um, and uh, look at the various mechanisms involved in relation to the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination or, or ICERD as its acronym is known. So as your own mentioned in the introduction uh, my own interest is in international human rights law, but when I was studying my PhD, I did it on caste-based discrimination in international human rights law. And in studying caste, um, I think what, what was interesting for me about caste was it certainly has its origins in religion. Uh, it has, I think, a lot of aspects of law about it as well uh, at the time. Um, and it, the way it's understood in India too, uh, or the way at least India portrays it on the international scene, in the 1990s, um, caste, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, argued that caste was a form of racial discrimination. So that was in 1996, and therefore it comes under the scope of the CERD Convention. So that was an interpretation uh, of the five grounds of, of racial discrimination under Article 1 of ICERD. Uh, it was, uh, which did not include the word caste, uh, it was not an interpretation that India agreed with, and uh, for 20 years, India has maintained that caste is not a form of racial discrimination that comes under the scope of this treaty. So uh, I've always been interested, I think, in that sort of uh, region between race and religion, which I think caste falls under. Um, and uh, I've also been interested in, I think, the various progressions or the two parallel progressions, as it were, that have happened under the United Nations, the pathway that race took and the pathway that religion took. And I think they have sort of uh, uh, taken two quite different pathways and this has emerged uh, as a very strong convention. So I think it's very interesting to look at this convention, how it deals with racist hate speech and perhaps uh, any, any, uh, any role in there for religion as well. So um, I'm going to just, I think, begin by outlining firstly my own uh, sort of little progression uh, through the UN history in terms of arriving at this point, in terms of arriving at this convention. Uh, firstly, uh, and by the way, I should add as well, um, any questions or comments at any point, please feel free to jump in So um, uh, at any time. But uh, we start, I think, in 1945 at the Charter of the United Nations, uh, the preamble, uh, which reaffirmed faith in human rights in Article 55 as well, uh, which is our human rights clause in the Charter of the UN. So what's interesting about the UN preamble, and the term human rights uh, that, is, that is there, uh, was that it was introduced by Jan Smuts of South Africa, who at the time was constructing, of course, uh, an apartheid state. So why would somebody who's in the process of constructing an apartheid state put the phrase human rights into the preamble of the Charter of the United Nations? So it's because um, it was the perception of human rights. So Smuts believed or understood human rights as meaning Nazi Germany, uh, Imperial Japan, he did not believe that it applied to internal or domestic policies in relation to racial equality. So that was the meaning of human rights as inserted in 1945. So it didn't take long, I think, for that sort of perception of human rights to be challenged. In fact, just one year later, in 1946, India raised before the very first General Assembly, uh, South Africa passed what was known as the Asiatic Land Tenure Act, uh, 
the Asiatic Land Tenure Act uh, denied land rights to the Indian population. We'd yet to get to the black population of South Africa. Um, and then uh, that was challenged by India on the floor of the General Assembly in 1946. So uh, India, which was led by um, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, the only woman leader delegation at the time in the UN, she challenged South Africa um, in relation to the Asiatic Land Tenure Act. South Africa said this is not within the remit of the General Assembly, Article 27 of the UN Charter, you cannot interfere with the internal affairs of states. And so there was a very important argument that took place in 1946 over whether racial discrimination in South Africa was within the remit of an international organization like the United Nations. And uh, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit won the argument. Now, uh, Britain and others lined up with South Africa. Uh, and the arguments were interesting because uh, South Africa said in the General Assembly that if, if you don't side with us on this, what will happen is that the treatment of black people in the United States uh, the treatment of the caste system in India will also eventually come under scrutiny. So they sort of said, of course, you can you can attack us now, but you're going to get your own policies uh, attacked later in time. And that, I think, proved prophetic. Uh, India won the argument. And so the UN General Assembly passed Resolution 44-1 on the treatment of Indians in South Africa, which affirmed that the UN was concerned with racial equality uh, at the domestic level and not only uh, an international understanding related to World War II. Uh, so that was 1946. Um, looking at that, that sort of development in the General Assembly in 1947, uh, I think really what, uh, what that was, uh, was what you might call today an interstate case. Really, that was an interstate dispute. That was India sticking up for its nationals against another state, South Africa. So the UN had yet to evolve a role for individuals or a role for civil society. So in 1947, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, representing uh, African Americans, uh, the Black Americans in the United States, uh, issued a petition to the UN in 1947, and they called that an appeal to the world. And an appeal to the world uh, set out uh, lynching, segregation, inequality in housing, inequality in voting as an appeal to the United Nations. So it went to the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities, and the Subcommission shrugged its shoulders and said, there's, there's nothing we can do about this. We don't yet have the machinery in place in which we can deal with a petition from an NGO like the NAACP. So while we can raise it at the interstate level, we don't yet have the machinery to deal with it in relation to the uh, individual or in relation to organizations. So. That went nowhere, but what the subcommission did do, or what the Commission on Human Rights did do, was decide to set up the machinery that would allow for petitions or allow the UN to be able to deal with petitions in this way. So from uh, the 1940s, the Commission on Human Rights begins to put together the machinery, the international human rights machinery. So they had uh, three things in mind, and these three phases would, would always happen in relation to um, the early, if you like, instruments. Firstly, you have a declaration, then you have a binding treaty, and then you have measures of implementation as they're known at the time. So we need a declaration, we need a treaty or convention, and we need measures of implementation. So in relation to human rights, it began in 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the Commission on Human Rights put together the UDHR, but it was not at the time a legally binding instrument, and it had no measures of implementation. There was no means by which states could be examined or uh, individuals could petition, etc. So we yet to have the other two aspects of it. 1948 declaration, we know then that when we get to the other two aspects, the treaty with the measures of implementation, it's 1966. So we'll have mentioned before the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So there's some big differences with the 48 Universal Declaration. First of all, they split between civil and political, economic, social and cultural rights. They give more power to civil and political rights than they do to economic, social and cultural rights. It would take about 50, 40 years to undo that. Um, and also, uh, it took quite a bit of time, 1948 to 1966. Uh, there was a draft of the Covenant in 1954, which I'll come back to. So by the time they get the Universal Declaration in 48, they get to the Covenants in 1966, something else happens in the meantime. Something else happens in the meantime. So what happens in the meantime is that in the winter of 1959, there's a global outbreak of anti-Semitic graffiti, which leads to concern in the UN Subcommission. A number of resolutions are passed on manifestations of anti-Semitism and racial or religious intolerance. These manifestations, as they're known, the subcommission and the commission at the time are smaller expert bodies composed 
almost exclusively of Western experts, uh, all male, by the way, all or mainly Western. There's very little African and Asian representation. But in the UN General Assembly uh, in the 1960s, Africa becomes, 1950s and 1960s, Africa becomes the most represented continent. So what happens is that when these resolutions on anti-Semitism get to the third committee of the General Assembly, the African states look at this issue of racial discrimination, religious intolerance, and say that we need to focus on racial discrimination. So what begins as a resolution of the UN subcommission in 1959 becomes a uh, 1962, the third committee decides to split the two issues. We're going to split racial discrimination and religious intolerance. Anti-Semitism is traditionally considered both. So it begins as a response to anti-Semitism covering racial and religious intolerance. In the third committee, they split it. And they split it with a view to prioritizing racial discrimination. So 1962, the decision arrives to split. Racial, uh, racial discrimination goes from 1962 resolution to 1963 declaration on the elimination of racial discrimination to 1965 international convention on the elimination of racial discrimination. From zero to binding international treaty in five years. Now that is remarkably quick. Why colonialism, apartheid South Africa, African states are driving this through a changed United Nations. Religion, on the other hand, languishes throughout the UN. By 1981, we have the Declaration, which probably the Special Rapporteur might have mentioned, uh, is one of the founding documents of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion's work. But that, that declaration has never been converted into a binding treaty. So religion has never found the same support uh, in the UN as racial discrimination. So uh, we get a much quicker uh, treaty in racial discrimination. In religion, we get only a non-binding declaration. By the way, minority rights has had a similar fate, F-A-T-E as well, in the sense that minority rights is also UN declaration, never got to a binding treaty as well. And I would argue that's because I think religious minorities are included in the concept of minority rights and states have always been less supportive of binding international rules around religion. So religion goes that direction, race goes this direction. So from uh, 19, um, uh, 1959 said resolution, 1963 declaration of the elimination of racial discrimination, and 1965 International Convention of the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or ICERT. It becomes the world's first UN human rights treaties. It's ahead of the ICCPR by a year. So although it's modeled on the draft of the International Covenant of Human Political Rights, it is adopted before that. And it also, by the way, helps free up some of the opposition to the ICCPR that was in existence as well. So this is a map of ICERT. It is today ratified by 182 states parties, only those in orange have not ratified. So uh, it is a treaty that very quickly was ratified as well. In other words, all states agree on the elimination of racial discrimination with some small exceptions. Handful of states have not ratified. They are um, <clears throat> Brunei, Malaysia, Myanmar, North Korea, South Sudan, and some Pacific Island countries. Everybody else has ratified the treaty. So uh, it was also very quickly ratified. So as mentioned, it's adopted on the 21st of December, 1965, as the first of the core, uh, the nine core UN human rights treaties. Um, 182 states parties today, as I mentioned. Um, but what's uh, crucial about ICERT or the difference to what the UN had done before was the establishment of the international machinery. So it's that second and third step together. It's the binding treaty with measures of implementation as they were known. So what CERT does is pioneer the measures of implementation. It brings about the very first UN treaty body, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination or CERT. And what's important is Patrick Thornbury, who uh, has written the principal commentary, on, on this convention and was a, a committee member as well, uh, is the existence of a multiplicity of supervision systems is an outstanding feature of the international human rights landscape. So I know that not all of you have, have a sort of a legal background or an international legal background, but we've heard as well in the previous talk, some distinctions between the Muslim world and ECHR, et cetera. So this is an international treaty that applies to Europe and the Muslim world and, and everywhere indeed. So it doesn't operate in the same way as the European Convention on Human Rights. The UN human rights treaties operate in a different way. Firstly, it's not a court, it's a committee. And so we know that uh, uh, the world as such would never agree to a court. There still is no international human rights court, uh, which I think is 
something which is never really talked about, but is, is important to recognize. Instead, we have a combination of mechanisms. So if we're looking at racist hate speech under ICERD, you can't look at it as only one. It's not only case law, for example, it's the combination of mechanisms that the committee does. So in order to achieve its principles, the treaty established the first UN treaty body, CERD. It monitors through um, uh, state reports under Article 9, interstate complaints under Articles 11 to 13 and 22, individual communications under Article 14, um, and uh, a few other measures that it has evolved as well. So roughly speaking, they can be divided into three, the state reports, the interstate cases, and individual cases, if you like. So the languages of communications at the international level rather than of cases. State reports are obligatory under Article 9. Every state reports to the committee. The committee issues concluding observations. Uh, these are guided also by general recommendations. And CERD was the first UN treaty body to issue general recommendations. And these can be in an important theme or uh, a particular group. It has a general recommendation on the Roma. It has a general recommendation on, on caste as well, pretty much. Uh, so, uh, but they can also be um, on uh, particular aspects as we shall see racist hate speech. It has general recommendations on that <laughs> as well. Uh, so uh, state reports, um, when, um, <clears throat> when they were drafting CERD as well, it was driven by the African states. Uh, there was, uh, it was a response to apartheid and colonialism. Uh, South Africa took part a little bit in the very early stages of the drafting of the declaration and then dropped out. Um, but they gave CERD more powers than any other UN human rights treaty uh, including the one that was being debated at the same time in the same time period, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the principal difference between CERD and all other of the UN human rights treaties that would follow is interstate communications under Articles 11 to 13. So what they gave CERD under 11 to 13 is a compulsory interstate communications mechanism. In other words, at any state that ratifies a treaty, the interstate mechanism before the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, it applies to that state. The state doesn't have to opt in. For all the other all the other UN human rights treaties, the interstate mechanism before the treaty body is optional. So the state has to decide to opt in. Uh, if they don't opt in, the mechanism doesn't apply. Now, uh, it, it is worth noting that when it comes to optional mechanisms under UN human rights treaties, there are certain states that never opt in. In fact, uh, there are many states that never opt in. China never opts in to any optional mechanism. India never opts in to any optional mechanism. So China and India cannot be brought before any UN human rights treaty body where the mechanism is optional. Individual communications are there under CERD as well. Uh, under CERD, that is optional, Article 14. So in other words, a state has to make a declaration under Article 14 acknowledging the competence of the committee to receive individual communications. So they have to, they ratify the treaty, they then make a declaration under Article 14, which allows an individual to bring a case before the committee. Under CERD, as is the case under many of the UN human rights treaties, many states have not opted in. Uh, to date, only 59 countries have opted in to the individual communications mechanism. So um, when it is optional, um, states uh, often um, don't opt in and it can be difficult I think to bring uh, certain states before any UN treaty body. The compulsory interstate mechanism would not be used until 2018 uh, but when it did um, the current communication that is going before the committee is Palestine versus Israel. So uh, Israel has not opted into any individual communications mechanism, Israel has not opted into any uh, interstate mechanism there is no regional human rights body that applies to Israel. Therefore, this is in fact the only mechanism by which you can get Palestine versus Israel before an international body at the state level. So that will, I think, highlight the significance of that provision, which lay dormant for quite a period of time. Um, so um, <clears throat> that's generally, I think, the, the features of the treaty or its, or its sort of monitoring. Does anyone, any questions on that before I, I look at the specific aspects of, of racist hate speech as they evolve as well? Okay, I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump forward then. So um, when they were um, when they were drafting ICERT, um, and I was asked for a reading for this summer school as well, 
Uh, and the reading I sent was actually around this time period. I think it's, uh, I know that some of you perhaps have a, a background in history and other disciplines as well. And so I, I like that paper because it does look at sort of the drafting of CERD from not only a legal perspective, as it were. Uh, when they were drafting ICERD, uh, when they were drafting the declaration in 1963, it went to the smaller expert bodies, which I mentioned already. So the UN subcommission would do a draft that would go to the commission, and then it would go to the third committee. Uh, in the smaller expert bodies, in the subcommission and the commission, there was a lot of debate around what should be included in the treaty, in particular uh, uh, around its um, provisions on hate speech, uh, its provisions on what sort of come to call racist hate speech. So the 1963 declaration uh, was the first document and it had Article 9. So Article 9, 1963 declaration has three provisions, which you can see there. All propaganda and organizations based on ideas or theories of superiority of one race or group of persons of one color or ethnic origin shall be severely condemned. Number two, all incitement to acts of violence against any race or group of persons shall be considered an offense against society and punishable under law. And number three, all states shall take immediate measures to prosecute and outlaw organizations which promote or incite to racial uh, discrimination. So um, this provision, Article 9, was strongly supported in, uh, in, in the subcommission by the USSR and its allies. In other words, it views, viewed this as something which with, with which to target the United States. Uh, Jim Crow laws in the United States. The United States, in terms of, has a very strong freedom of expression and, uh, I think, um, advocacy at the international level. Um, and so <clears throat> the USSR saw in this, I think, a means by which to, to target the United States, but there was also a lot of support for this uh, provision banning racist organizations. The United States, of course, still allows for the Ku Klux Klan and other hate-based organizations to exist. It doesn't ban or prohibit racist organizations. It believes that the best way of doing this is to allow the sort of the marketplace of ideas and that eventually their ideas will be shouted down by, by stronger ideas based around equality and that the solution is not to ban but to allow these racist organizations. So Article 9 was a sort of a direct challenge to the United States philosophy almost on how to deal with racial equality. So uh, one of the drafters uh, was named as Morris Abram, who was from the southern United States and had uh, cut his teeth on sort of anti-segregation uh, dealing with or, or challenging segregation laws, etc. So he was well placed to sort of present the American viewpoint. He wanted to bring the subcommission to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to see the city, the city too busy to hate, as, as it was sort of known, to see that you could advance racial equality while allowing for racist organizations to exist, that you didn't need to ban them, that this treaty shouldn't ban racist organizations, it shouldn't ban racist hate speech, that racial progress can happen without banning, without criminalizing. So that's what Morris Abram tried to do. He tried to convince the subcommission not to, uh, not to support this provision. So Abram lost the argument. Uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, there was, there was riots around the visit of the UN subcommission. Uh, and so um, that, that argument was ultimately uh, lost. The USSR and its allies uh, won the argument. Um, Article 9 stayed in the 1963 declaration. So Article 9 stayed in despite the American opposition. Now the America, the America or the US had its allies as well. So although the subcommission was small, it had its allies in terms of the voting on the declaration that would take place in the UN General Assembly. So when it came to voting on the 1963 declaration, it was adopted, nobody voted against, but there were 17 abstentions to the 1963 declaration. So which is interesting to see uh, a declaration of elimination of racial discrimination that in the 1960s with apartheid South Africa, uh, with, all, uh, with colonialism, that nevertheless 17 states abstained from voting on this declaration. Now, why did they abstain? And by the way, uh, who abstained? It was all Western states, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, and Western Europe. Nobody from outside that sort of grouping abstained. And Ireland abstained in the 1963 declaration as well, which I think is an interesting sort of point in relation to our own history on these issues. Um, so um, here's what Mr. Shields of Ireland said in 1963 uh, when explaining Ireland's abstention. 
The people of this country had always abhorred racial discrimination as being fundamentally evil, so it attacked the very nature of man himself, and the Irish delegation in the UN had never failed to condemn such discrimination. He therefore regretted that Article 9 interfered with the freedoms of expression and association and made it impossible for him to support the draft declaration as a whole. So because of Article 9, Ireland felt unable to support the treaty, which included, by the way, a condemnation of apartheid in Article 5. Uh, Mrs. Kume from Japan. Her delegation had been faced with a dilemma since Article 9 was not compatible with the Japanese constitution, yet at the same time, Japan was anxious to see racial discrimination eradicated. So Mrs. Kume also raised this sort of problem of the compatibility of Article 9 with the constitution of Japan, but didn't actually abstain. Japan didn't abstain, it voted in favor, but it just mentioned uh, that it had some issues with this as well. Mr. Mohammed from Somalia, Freedom of speech and association, if permitted to degenerate until it provoked social disturbances and impaired the rights of others, should be regarded as licensed and punished as such. So other delegations, such as that of Somalia, were, 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 were sort of attacking, if you like, the, the, the US uh, and allies position and saying that freedom of expression should not be allowed to sort of undermine uh, the rights of others. So that was the position in relation to the 1963 declaration. Two years later, the 1965 convention is adopted, and when it is adopted, everybody votes in favor, except for one abstention, Mexico, and Mexico abstained because it had a provision on reservations, so nothing to do with hate speech and freedom of expression. It had an issue with a clause on reservations, and it then later withdrew its abstention. In other words, when it came to the convention itself, the opposition fell away in the sense of abstaining or even voting against, although nobody had voted against the declaration. Uh, so why did the Western opposition disappear when it came to the 1965 uh, convention? And so the reason uh, is that Article 4 of ICERD, which is our main provision on hate speech, um, states parties condemn all propaganda and all organizations which are based on ideas or theories of superiority of one race or group of persons of one color, ethnic origin, or which attempt to justify or promote racial hatred, and to this end, with due regard to the principles embodied in UDHR and the rights expressly set forth in Article 5 of this Convention, A, B, and C. So essentially, A is declare an offence punishable by law, all dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred, all dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred, and incitement to such acts. So that's what A does. B is declare illegal and prohibit organisations. Uh, like the Ku Klux Klan and others, and C refers specifically to public authorities, national or local, uh, not being permitted to promote or incite racial discrimination. So actually, there's not a whole lot of difference between Article 4 and uh, Article 9 of the preceding declaration. The main difference is here. So the main difference is what's known as the due regard clause. The due regard clause is considered to allow for freedom of expression because it's with due regard to the principles embodied in the UDHR, which includes freedom of expression, and the rights set forth in Article 5 of the Convention. Article 5 is a listing uh, that includes civil and political rights, that includes freedom of expression. So um, the due regard clause, which was introduced by the Scandinavian countries, uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, was considered to uh, allow, allow support for the convention. Uh, and so the states voted in favor, um, but they added reservations all the same. And Article 4 would become the most reserved provision after Article 22. So that's, that's about to ask about reservations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so there were uh, reservations entered, and I, I just, again, a few brief examples. Uh, the United States, um, the Constitution and laws of the United States contain extensive protections of individual freedom of speech, expression and association. Accordingly, the U.S. does not accept any obligation under its convention, in particular under Articles 4 and 7, to restrict those rights. Now, arguably, that, that reservation is not needed because they put in the due regard clause with precisely that in mind. But nevertheless, uh, Western states felt compelled to ratify the convention with the reservation in place because... How, how strong an obligation is this? What exactly does the due regard clause mean? Uh, Ireland also entered a reservation to Article 4, still in place today. Ireland considers that through such measures, the right to freedom of expression and association may not be jeopardized. So we cannot jeopardize the right to freedom of expression and association. It's interesting that these reserving states also mention not only freedom of expression, but also freedom of association. 
to allow the ability to allow racist organizations uh, that that could rather than be a violation of the treaty. Japan, which I mentioned already, in applying the provisions of 4A and B, Japan fulfills the obligations to the extent that is compatible with the rights to freedom of association and expression under the constitution of Japan. So a bit like its interpretive statement in relation to the 63 declaration, it's saying the same thing. So we will implement this to the point where it's compatible with our constitution. So what Article 4 is, to take a step back slightly, and uh, it has been described as a bit of an outlier in international human rights law. So we've heard a bit about the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which prohibits incitement in Article 20, but generally Article 19 is about freedom of expression, uh, which does not with limitation clauses. So you can have freedom of expression, but you cannot use it to have racist hate speech against groups. Article 4 is different. Because Article 4 is an obligation so that you shall declare an offence punishable by law, all dissemination of ideas, as well as incitement. So uh, you have to put that into law. Similarly, you have to put it into law that you prohibit racist organisations. And thirdly, it has that focus on public authorities promoting or inciting racial discrimination. So Article 4 is best considered as an obligation. It's not just... Uh, a sort of a limitation to freedom of expression. It's more on the side of an obligation to put in laws against hate speech and to prohibit organizations which uh, have sort of comments on racist, uh, sort of racist comments or racist, uh, racist based organizations. So Article 4 does have quite far reaching obligations. And for those states which had concerns about this, which did not want to ban racist organizations like the United States, then I think there's little doubt that the reservation was required that the due regard clause does not necessarily uh, take away from the obligation to implement laws on racist hate speech and to prohibit organizations, racist organizations. And this was quickly um, borne out in relation to CERD practice. So um, <clears throat> the treaty was drafted in 1965. It set up the first UN treaty body, um, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and CERD began its work in 1970. So it begins, uh, it begins receiving state reports um, and monitoring the treaty from 1970. So while the due regard clause was inserted at the drafting stage to ensure a balance between Article 4 and freedom of expression and association, Nevertheless, uh, historically, CERD interpretation and practice emphasized the obligations in Article 4 over the requisite balance with freedom of expression. So uh, the committee itself uh, quickly established that the due regard clause did not allow states to escape from the obligations of Article 4. So it quickly affirmed that these were mandatory uh, and that they were not sort of optional. That the due regard clause did not mean that implementing these were optional. So uh, it's in 1972. So I mentioned the general recommendations. So these are um, statements of the committee that interpret certain provisions or interpret certain obligations of the treaty. Uh, and its first one was around or in relation to Article 4, the obligations of Article 4. So General Recommendation 1 in 1972, the first ever General Recommendation issued by UN Treaty Body Committee found that legislation of a number of states parties did not include the provisions envisaged in 4A and B, the implementation of which is obligatory under the convention for all states parties. So it doesn't include uh, legislation in 4A and 4B is not included uh, by a number of states parties um, and the committee considered this mandatory. So from 1972, the committee found that it is mandatory to declare an offence punishable by law all dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred as well as incitement to racial discrimination and similarly to prohibit all organisations. So from 1972, the committee begins to establish an obligatory implementation of Article 4 and that the due regard clause did not mean that that was optional. Um, <clears throat> essentially, that's the way uh, the committee viewed Article 4 in relation to all states that were reporting before it. Uh, 
Um, and as I shall get to, uh, although it gets modified, uh, it still really is, in my view, one of the primary functions, if you like, or one of the one of the roles of the committee is to ensure that states have legislation to respond to racist state speech and to deal with racist organizations. So that is something that the committee views as an obligation under the treaty. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, in which there was a lot of ethnic hatred, a lot of ethnic violence, prompted the committee to go back to Article 4 and to re-emphasize its importance again to states' parties. So it issued General Recommendation 15 on organized violence based on ethnic origin. Uh, that was in 1993. Uh, when the ICERD was being adopted, Article 4 was regarded as central to the struggle against racial discrimination. At that time, there was a widespread fear of the revival of authoritarian ideologies, prescription of the dissemination of ideas of racial superiority and of organized activity likely to incite persons to racial violence was properly regarded as crucial. Since that time, the committee has received evidence of organized violence based on ethnic origin and the political exploitation of ethnic difference. As a result, implementation of Article 4 is now of increased importance. So uh, in 1972, it viewed Article 4 in terms of an obligation. In 1993, it viewed the implementation of Article 4 as being of increased importance. So at no point uh, in its opening decades, if you like, did the committee sort of emphasize the other side of the coin? At no point did it sort of acknowledge, if you like, the freedom of expression and association arguments that might be there on the other side. So it fairly single-mindedly uh, required states to implement the obligations of Article 4 through the state reporting mechanism. Um, it would take uh, into the 2000s before CERD's approach would change. And um, I'll go first, keep it on the general recommendations, but I'll, I'll go back to um, some, of the, uh, some of the case law as well uh, that, would, that would come up uh, and some of the examples also. Um, but in uh, 2013, CERD issued general recommendation 35 on racist hate speech, and that is widely considered uh, to have sort of addressed the imbalance that is there in the early uh, workings of the committee. So GR 35 on combating racist hate speech sought to address the imbalance in 2013. So the committee considered that it had to, uh, it had to sort of reassess the way it was dealing with Article 4 in light of other external factors that should be brought into account. So essentially, um, uh, two years earlier, it was mentioned, uh, the Human Rights Committee had issued General Comment uh, 34 in 2011 on Article 19, Freedom of Expression, so that was in 2011. In 2012, you had the Rabat Plan of Action as well, which looked at the right response to hate speech, and I think is probably part of your project as well, or certainly some of the uh, aspects of, of the Rabat Plan of Action, it talks about the hate speech pyramid and things like that. So there were clearly developments, or, or the response to hate speech had evolved. Uh, Sir, general recommendations were a little out of kilter and a little out of time. And so GR35 is perhaps a recognition of that, and it provides a more nuanced understanding of the meaning of uh, Article 4 in light of these other wider developments. So um, uh, GR35 is considered to do three things. Firstly, render CERD's interpretation of Article 4 more consonant with contemporary interpretations of freedom of expression, notably 19 and 20 of the ICCPR, as well as General Comment 34 of the Human Rights Committee. So firstly, take into account what's going on in other UN treaty bodies, that CERD sure, doesn't operate alone within the UN system. They also have to ensure that what they're doing fits. Although, as I said, it's a difference of emphasis to what the Human Rights Committee does. Nevertheless, it can't contradict or counteract what the Human Rights Committee is doing as well. So it sort of takes into account what's happening outside of uh, the, uh, the committee's own work. Secondly, it looks at the treaty as a whole. So it looks at Article 4, not in isolation, but in relation to other provisions of the Convention as well. So ICERD includes other provisions, some of which refer to education, for example, Article 7, 
And so uh, it believes that you can counter or counteract hate speech in other ways, as well as through legislation prohibiting organizations, et cetera. So it looks at that role in terms of education uh, and the full span of procedures under the convention. So it looks at Article 4, not in isolation, but in relation to other uh, provisions within the treaty as well. And finally, and very importantly, it differentiates between different types of racist hate speech, which had also emerged in the Rabat plan of action. Uh, GR 35 reads, criminalization of forms of racist expression should be reserved for serious cases in paragraph 12. So on the, on the face of it, or rather a very strict reading of article four would seem to think that criminalization is a response to everything. If there is a racist speech, you criminalize it, you prohibit it, and that's it. So uh, GR 35 talks about criminalization reserved for serious cases and uh, so that it should only be used for serious cases supports a range of strategies against racist hate speech other than criminalization in the fields of teaching education culture and information which all forms part of article 7 of of the treaty as well so criminalization for the most serious and other strategies that can respond as well including teaching education culture and information um, so <clears throat> that's what sort of GR35 is trying to do. Uh, nevertheless, and I think this is sort of important to recognize in relation to CERD, uh, I think uniquely within the UN treaty system, is that it still requires states to adopt legislation to combat racist hate speech that falls within its scope. So that requirement or that obligation of Article 4 has not gone away. And if you look at a country like Ireland, CERD concluding observations to Ireland, will emphasize the inadequacy or the lack of uh, legislation to prohibit hate speech. There is legislation in Ireland, but it's widely considered to be inadequate. So if our reports to CERD, they will still go back to their original role, which is where is your legislation in relation to hate speech? Uh, or if you have it, why is it so ineffective? So GR35 does recalibrate, it does rebalance, but it doesn't take away the primary obligatory core of Article 4. And CERD, I think, will not change that requirement. So you're still all dissemination of ideas based on racial or ethnic superiority by whatever means. And that is, I think, controversial for some people, that uh, for many, that the dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority should be illegal. Uh, many believe in the United States, you might not like it, but it shouldn't be illegal. Uh, incitement to hatred, which is obviously congruent with the ICCPR and general international standards. Threats or incitement to violence. Expressions of insult, ridicule, or slander of persons when it clearly amounts to incitement to hatred or discrimination. So it does include those more controversial areas of uh, incitement to ridicule, for example, which many believe fall squarely under freedom of expression. CERD seems to think it does not if it amounts to incitement to hatred or discrimination. So again, they're balancing, but at the same time, they're not excluding uh, incitement to ridicule as being part of the Article 4 obligation and particip participation in organizations' activities which promote and incite racial discrimination. So they still consider uh, racist organizations to be, uh, a, if you don't prohibit them, you are in violation of the convention. But GR35, while it sets out these obligations, it also lists contextual factors. So uh, it understands that these, uh, there are many examples which do not fall easily under certain categories. And so it says that there are also contextual factors, some of which I think were raised in the discussions earlier as well. Firstly, the content and form of speech, uh, the style in which the speech was delivered. Uh, secondly, economic, social, and political climate prevalent at the time. Uh, for example, it had in mind, it has indicators on genocide. So uh, hate speech, which is taking place in a climate where a group is being targeted, as happened in relation to Rwanda, seen before the International Criminal Tribunal in the, in the Nahimana case. Uh, if there is a climate uh, of, of, of discrimination against a particular group, then uh, that would be in favor of um, regulation. The position or status of the speaker, and CERT has always had a concern with politicians uh, issuing racist state speech. Um, and so if it is high ranking politicians, CERT is, is minded that this should perhaps result in prosecution or criminalization. Uh, the reach of the speech, so it has a concern. Another contextual factor, is it being disseminated on the internet? Is it being disseminated on Facebook or WhatsApp, as we've seen in a number of recent circumstances in Myanmar, not part of the treaty, but we've seen, again, dissemination is another contextual factor and the objectives of the speech. So this bears in mind that hate speech laws can and have been used to target minorities. So uh, who 
is using the speech, what are the objectives of that speech? So Sir is aware also the need to protect freedom of expression of minority groups and the ability of government to use hate speech laws against minority groups. So the objectives of the speech are also a contextual factor. So that's what GR 35 does. I think affirms the obligations of Article 4, provides contextual factors by which any particular circumstance can be weighed. Um, and uh, nevertheless, I think uh, does also underline the core obligation that remains in Article 4 while ensuring it fits with the wider human rights framework. So um, that approach or the approach that is seen in GR 35 is reflected in concluding observations in this area. So uh, we see, um, and I'll give you a few examples on that. Uh, for example, Honduras from 20, or uh, uh, let's say Hungary first. So Hungary from 2019. If you look at the concluding observations on Hungary, they read, deeply alarmed by the prevalence of racist hate speech against the Roma, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and other minorities, fueling hatred and intolerance at times, and at times incitement of violence towards such groups, in particular from leading politicians and in the media, including on the internet, deeply concerned at the presence and operation of organizations that promote racial hatred in the society. So in relation to uh, Hungary, the committee is clearly uh, alarmed, as it says, by the prevalence of hate speech in Hungary, targeted at Roma, targeted at asylum seekers, targeted at migrants, uh, being used by politicians, and the existence of racist organizations as well. So its response is a very sort of classical third Article 4 response. Committee recommends the state party identify, register, investigate, and prosecute cases of racist hate speech or incitement, sanction those responsible, declare illegal, and prohibit organizations that promote and incite racial hatred. Now, that is not, you know, the view of, of the United States in the 1960s. So that is you investigate and you prosecute and you ban the organizations in question, or at least uh, you declare illegal and prohibit the organizations in question, which is sort of the same thing. Um, if we look at Honduras 2019, the committee reiterates its concern regarding the persistence of stereotypes and prejudice in society against indigenous and Afro-Honduran peoples, which continues to be an impediment to the building of a multicultural society, urges the state party to organize awareness raising and education campaigns on behalf of society in general on the negative impact of racial discrimination with a view to combating stereotypes and prejudice against indigenous and Afro-Honduran peoples. So here we see that more general recommendation 35 post-2013 approach of the committee, which is about the stereotyping of Afro-Honduran people, the stereotyping of indigenous peoples in Honduras, and the need to tackle that through education or other non-criminal means. So that's very different to what they're saying in relation to Hungary and uh, employing the more Article 7, the more education, based approach. Cameroon from 2022 uh, regrets the lack of efforts taken to monitor the spread of hate speech on the internet and social media, review its legal framework, particularly the penal code to explicitly criminalize racist hate speech, including online and hate crimes in line with Article 4. Uh, develop and conduct training programs on hate crime and hate speech for police officers, prosecutors, judges, uh, with a view to investigating racist hate crimes and prosecuting those responsible. So, that's Cameroon, that's from um, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Cameroon, there are issues going on with hate speech in Cameroon. So uh, it has been, there's been an alarming and reported rise of hate speech in Cameroon linked to conflicts or tensions between the French speaking and English speaking parts of the country. So the committee is aware of this, is getting information from NGOs on this. Again, it responds with the strong end of Article 4 not only that you prosecute, but also believes that there isn't training. You train police officers, prosecutors, judges, and law enforcement officials on identifying, investigating, and prosecuting those responsible. So not only do you prosecute, but also you, you train in order to be able to identify and then prosecute those responsible. So um, surge concluding observations are not sort of, uh, I mean, you know, the language is always quite similar, and sometimes you just have to read a little bit into it, I think. But I would read into those concluding observations on Cameroon uh, a very grave concern of the committee with hate speech uh, and a requirement of a specific national response to it. So um, that would be uh, uh, some, I think, um, some examples in relation to uh, concluding observations. Um, I'll just give one more example as well from 2022 uh, of the other side of the coin, which is Kazakhstan. The committee is concerned that the overly broad provisions of Article 174 of the Criminal Code 
including on incitement of social, ethnic, tribal, racial, class, or religious discord, may lead to unnecessary or disproportionate interference with freedom of expression, including of ethnic minority groups. So there in the same session, there's issuing a concern within Kazakhstan with the use of laws to attack minority groups uh, with the freedom of expression, looking to protect freedom of expression of ethnic minority groups in Kazakhstan. So we get again, that sort of mixture, uh, that more complex uh, response of the committee in terms of its practice through, uh, through um, state reports. So uh, there are, as I said, a multiplicity of supervisory uh, mechanisms under search. So I'm gonna to jump to the next one. Does anyone have any questions on, on the state reports perhaps? I'll, I'll jump then to the, yeah, I'll jump to the next one. So I'm gonna look at just the two more and in, in uh, firstly, individual communications, and then I'm gonna conclude with interstate communications as well, and how hate speech has become part of interstate communications uh, before the International Court of Justice. Uh, but firstly, let's stop at the individual communications, the case law. So we heard a bit in the last session, talk of, you know, I'm, and, and I haven't been here all week, but the, um, the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights, you'd be familiar with many of the cases that, that come before the ECHR, um, some of them um, on, on Article 10, on Holocaust denial um, and, and, and other aspects, but CERD also has case law in this area. Um, as I mentioned, Article 14 is optional, so it doesn't apply automatically when a country ratifies a treaty. So while China has ratified ICERD, it has not opted in to Article 14, which means that an individual Uyghur cannot bring a case against China before the Committee of the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And it was a Uyghur cannot bring a case against China to any international human rights body, in fact, because China doesn't opt in. In fact, only 59 states have opted in under Article 14. So uh, that is a much lower number than have opted in to the um, to the treaty itself. Um, and so uh, it includes also, as mentioned, the world's most populous countries, China, India, the United States, Pakistan, Indonesia, none of them have opted in under Article 14. So there is a big gap in terms of international human rights law, in terms of countries that never opt into anything. On the other hand, of the 59 states, almost all of the European states have opted in. So you get cases involving Denmark, uh, involving Norway before both the European Court of Human Rights and before uh, many of the UN Human Rights Committees as well. Uh, I won't uh, just to, I'll just look at two. Uh, so they both, in fact, every case involved, there's only a handful of cases that don't involve Europe before the committee. Um, but Jewish Community of Oslo versus Norway from 2005. Uh, this involved a group known as the Boot Boys, um, essentially a far right group in Norway, commemorating Rudolf Hess. Uh, who were prosecuted by the Norwegian Supreme Court, uh, who, who, which found that if they were to penalize approval of Nazism, uh, that would involve prohibiting Nazi organizations, which it considered would go too far and be incompatible with freedom of expression. So it's not only the United States that has this sort of understanding, but Norway as well felt it would go too far uh, to prohibit Nazi organizations. Therefore, the uh, leader of the Boot Boys was not prosecuted by Norway, and the case, case was taken uh, to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as a result. So, Sird held the statements were of a manifestly offensive character, not protected by the due regard clause, and his acquittal by the Supreme Court gave rise to a violation of Article 4. So, Sird looked at that decision of the Supreme Court of Norway and said it doesn't give effects to Article 4, uh, therefore that acquittal is a violation of Article 4. Now, um, for the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination to essentially challenge the decision of the Supreme Court of Norway, I mean, that's ultimately what the individual communications mechanism is about. You have to exhaust domestic remedies. So uh, nevertheless, for some, that's perhaps surprising uh, on some level, unless there's something fundamentally wrong with the decision, if the decision has been conducted in accordance with law, some believe that surge shouldn't be overturning a decision like this, that Norway is closer to the ground, can better assess the circumstances that are in play in Norway and make its own determinations on this issue. And perhaps unsurprisingly, this returned in TBB versus Germany, which involved um, Mr. Sarazin, who was a member of the German Central Bank, Philo Sarazin, who gave an interview 
in which he discussed the economic productivity of various sections of Germany's uh, population. So uh, he made discriminatory statements about Germany, allegedly discriminatory statements about Germany's Turkish and Arab population. So he was a relatively high figure in the German bank who gave an interview making uh, allegedly discriminatory comments about the economic productivity of Germany's Turkish and Arabic uh, populations. Um, was not prosecuted, um, and CERD found the state party failed its duty to carry out an effective investigation as to whether or not Sarazen's statements amounted to dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred. So it was looked into, a decision was taken not to prosecute. Uh, CERD said that that was a violation of Article 4. And this prompted a dissenting opinion from CERD member Carlos Vazquez, uh, who was a US member of CERD. Um, Vasquez's dissent was in fact the very first ever dissent in the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Up until this point, there had never been a dissenting opinion. In fact, CERD generally operates on the basis of consensus. So that will tell you, I think, how different it is, or it is quite different to the way, the way a, court, uh, a court might operate. So this was the very first dissent. Uh, Vasquez argued about the principle of expediency, as it's known, uh, which generally the freedom to prosecute or not to prosecute, um, and that that's sort of a prerogative of states, whether to prosecute or not to prosecute. Um, and uh, so, so Vasquez said that, that, that Germany really should, should have that freedom. So I think there are, there are nuances. Um, uh, it was um, the, the, the decision not to prosecute was largely, I think, made on the fact that it wasn't um, it wasn't incitement, which it wasn't, but nevertheless, Article 4 is more than incitement, as we've heard. It also includes um, a, a dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority. So arguably, uh, the, Turk, the German prosecutor never looked at that aspect of Sarah's statement. And so uh, I think there is some, some, uh, some waste to Serge's decision as well, which has not really been uh, fully acknowledged. Nevertheless, uh, the Vasco's dissent got a lot of support. And in fact, General Recommendation 35 did follow uh, that decision in which Sir perhaps took a step back and said, we do need to reassess where we're at with racist hate speech and freedom of expression. Interestingly, there would only be one other dissent of CERD, which would happen in the first interstate case, Palestine versus Israel, in which five CERD members would dissent on the issue of jurisdiction, believing that the committee did not have jurisdiction in, uh, in Palestine versus Israel. So, um, it would take, uh, that's only, only the second, uh, that would only be the second uh, dissent in, um, in CERT history. Um, some have argued that this, there should be a margin of appreciation. Euro, yeah? Yeah, just... Uh... Go for it. Yeah. And so there are questions you have what makes the search company. If there is intersectionality, yeah, okay, thanks. And um, I think I got both questions, but um, on, on the issue of standing, I mean, what's 
important here is the uh, Article 14 includes groups as well as individuals. So generally, CERD has interpreted that as representative groups. So if it is Koptova versus Slovakia is another case where it's essentially the Roma Rights Centre, um, they will allow representative NGOs to bring cases before them. So in terms of standing, they will allow that if it's, if it's sufficiently representative. Obviously, they don't allow an individual with no connection to bring, bring a communication, but they will allow a representative organization. So in generally, they have taken, I think, a relatively open approach to those issues of standing. On intersectionality, they've debated about their role in relation to religion for, uh, I mean, since from the very early years, 1984, it was one of the first debates within the committee as to whether um, it involved somebody issuing leaflets vilifying Islam, whether that comes under the scope of the convention or not. So in terms of intersectionality, uh, they are fairly clear that they have a mandate if in relation to religion over ethno-religious groups. So purely religious matters are outside the scope of CERD, but if it's an ethno-religious matter, it's within the scope of CERD. Uh, they've done the same thing in relation to language, issues purely linguistic groups. Uh, for example, Irish speakers in Ireland are a linguistic minority. They're not an ethno-linguistic minority, so they would have no mandate in relation to Irish speakers in Ireland, but they do have a mandate in relation to linguistic groups in Vietnam or Laos, in which they've said there is a link with ethnicity as well. So if they see a link with ethnicity and they're relatively open about that, then they will believe that they have a mandate. So they certainly have a mandate for ethno-religious groups, ethno-linguistic groups, not purely religious groups and not purely linguistic groups. But for example, they've discussed Muslims in Nigeria. So I mean, some would argue that these, is there a difference of ethnicity? Uh, but they, they believe there is. So they've talked about the treatment of the differing penal sanctions for Muslim women in Northern Nigeria as opposed to the South. So that's a very intersectional, gender, race, and religion. Uh, and so they have been able to make that link. But they do, they are clear that purely religious issues and purely linguistic issues are outside the scope of the And I would agree on that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the findings of committees, any of the UN committees, very interesting, it was very good when it goes in a way we kind of like, agree with, but obviously then, you know, the stuff doesn't necessarily make national news and doesn't always like kind yeah. of come down to where it should, like if we're fighting race to take that kind of thing, you know, we also get to society and be fighting stigma and discrimination in states. So I was just wondering, after the TV Germany, Germany did go that they Germany felt kind of what happened afterwards, did it then make a difference? You're right that uh, I mean I was um, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a slightly example, but I was involved somebody who was doing an article on the Palestine versus Israel communication, yeah. which is about as high profile as it gets yeah. in terms of the UN system. And you know, I was speaking to him, and then he gave he gave the title of the piece, which was "Obscure UN Committee to Decide on uh, Apartheid in Palestine versus Israel." Yeah. So I just liked his understanding of it from both as "Obscure UN Committee." So I think that probably summarizes how absurd it is in the mass media. I don't think there's any. Uh, it's on daily life, right? Like yeah. The person who was subject sure. to racist discrimination, even if your country's done this, right? Unless sure. you're involved in it. No. Everyone knows that accessibility is no. Solid. And that's why, but that's why a committee like CERDIN has involved NGOs and mainstream yeah. NGOs into their work. And that's yeah. why, I mean, they believe that really recommendations are not necessarily for the media, although that's welcome too, but that really it's for NGOs to use as tools in relation to their own national authorities. So I think they would accept, I mean, a decision like TBB will not have a wider effect in the mass media in Germany, but nevertheless, it may, you know, I think communications like this may have an influence itself. I think it's, there are very few studies of follow-ups to CERD communications. First of all, there are very few of them, uh, but there's one other example, and I mean, just to take away from TBB, but there's a case called Hagen versus Australia about a, an Aboriginal man who tries to get a sign taken down from a sports stadium in Australia. Uh, it's the N-word. So it's a white Australian rugby player who had a nickname with the N-word in it, gets a stand named after him, and the, the name goes up on the stand, and uh, Stephen Hagen takes the case. Uh, to serve, first of all, through the various levels in Australia, news is all the way through, in which they say it's a nickname of a sports person, what's your problem, uh, all the way through, takes it to CERD, wins in CERD, wins, um, goes back to Australia, and they still refuse to take the sign down. So um, it ultimately, he wrote a book called The N-Word, One Man Stand, which is published by an Aboriginal press, 
And that's worth a read because he, he talks about all the way through, all the way up to serve what he considered to be the highest court in the world. And, uh, and then all the way back to Australia. Eventually the stand was demolished as part of repairs that they were doing supposedly, but they never actually implemented the decision and specifically said they weren't. And so, but I think his issue was, was profile. There was profile, there was media around it. So. And so the Germany case, Germany really do, they no, no, no. And the decision has been, to the extent that the decision is, is out there, it has been created in some of the rare writings that happen, not rare, but not many writings. There has been writings from scholars that this decision is wrong and should, there should be a margin of appreciation in certain decisions, which, is something I'm really against because margin appreciation works in a regional context, but not in an international context. So there, the, there has been some critical analysis of the decision that's out there. Yeah. Many different European countries because that you know by saying the word race or reproducing it, what it's Finland was recently named. Kind of the most racist country in Europe. Yeah. On ethnicity or race, whichever term. Not existing. Simultaneously, it exists. Yeah. I don't think it's there's no way of improving. Thanks, great, great question and great point. So, um, I mean, it's obviously there's a lot, a lot of complexity to that, but I would say firstly, under the treaty, the treaty's um, mandate is racial discrimination, which includes race, but four other terms as well. So it's um, uh, Article 1, 1 definition, it's race, color, descent, national origin and ethnic origin. So racial discrimination in a legal sense includes, but is not limited to race. Uh, so I just say that firstly, that's why it can include issues like caste, um, or uh, uh, indigenous peoples, for example, indigenous peoples, you know, many would argue there's not, it's not about racial differences, etc. So it can include many other groups. Uh, it never, CERT has never gotten into the meaning of race. Uh, it has never put forth its own meaning of race, uh, nor will it, and nor should it. Uh, UNESCO did that. UNESCO did what are known as four studies on the race question in 1950s, 1960s, where it tried to argue about the meaning of race from a biological perspective, sociological perspective, whether race has a meaning or not. So CERD doesn't engage with that at all. It simply views racial discrimination as a legal concept that includes race, other terms as well, uh, and it doesn't get into what the meaning of race might be. Um, thirdly, on states not uh, accepting race. France is another example. In France, argues before Sir that it's unconstitutional to identify on the basis of race. And um, so you get, I wouldn't agree with you that many European states do this. I think, I think there are in the UK, for example, they take data on race all the time. Uh, so, you know, race, ethnic origin, et cetera. So some states do, some states don't. Uh, I know France doesn't on Finland as well. Um, CERD views data collection as an obligation under the treaty. Now, CERD is a treaty body. It doesn't mean states will necessarily follow what they do, but they do view the collection of data on race as an ob obligation under the treaty. So they've been collecting data. They require data as to who your ethnic groups are. In fact, in the early years of CERD, every country came before them and said, we don't have any racial discrimination. So in the first 40 state reports, most of them said, we don't have any problems with racial discrimination. Were they, were they trying to fool the committee? They were, they were simply ratifying the treaty, which they believed was about apartheid South Africa, uh, racism purely on the basis of skin color, uh, white minority racism in Southern Africa being the paradigmatic example. So countries like Madagascar will go up to the committee and say, we don't have any racial discrimination because we don't have any. Uh, and so it still happens today. Egypt has done it. Qatar has done it. Jamaica has done it where they'll say, we are homogenous, we have no racial. So the committee deals with that all the time. They have a fairly a line, which they always do, which is no state is free from racial discrimination, no state is homogenous. And then they argue that uh, they try to get states to understand ethnic differences, for example, that that's under the mandate of the treaty, race, color, descent, national origin, ethnic origin. So they will talk about ethnic differences. They'll talk about migrant workers in Qatar, for example. 
Nobody is arguing that migrant workers form a race. On the other hand, are migrant workers part of the remit of CERD? Yes, they are, because they have inter So committee interprets its mandate, but stays within the scope of the treaty. It always asks for data. Uh, states don't always supply it. States like France argue on the basis of their constitution, which is an argument I disagree with, by the way, uh, in relation to France. I don't believe France is constitutionally barred from, from uh, collecting data on this. Um, I think that's an interpretation of its constitution and is not actually a requirement of the constitution. So, um, yeah, and I think the United States, for example, collects data on race. I mean, we've, you know, the US, uh, obviously, uh, many issues come up under treaty in relation to the United States, but it talks about race openly and, and has, has data in relation to African Americans in prison, etc. So, without data, you can't really understand racial discrimination in the country, so it's something that the committee uses. Another question here? Um, so I'd be, I'd be interested in opposition in Finland as well to that approach. Is it there? Is there opposition in Finland to Finland's sort of racial blindness approach? Yeah. This is not something that Europe considers itself as one that is However, it exports it to like America. Yeah. Germany, not something that they sit in different ways. So there is no opposition yet. Yeah. It's almost scary that conversation ends there. there so i mean i i would i would disagree with that approach in finland i think that you, you know that the, the conversation shouldn't end and i think that third also one of the things they use is that the convention is a living instrument it was obviously influenced by apartheid south africa etc but they've evolved it to include caste groups indigenous peoples and others so it becomes meaningless if peru reports to the committee and is only concerned with you know issues like uh, uh, and, and will not report on indigenous groups so essentially you can call it whatever you call it exactly that they're the groups of concern to the committee and has evolved its approach in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of lets you off the hook in terms of remedies yeah. at the national level. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm South African and we consider that. Yeah. Uh, we have everything from affirmative action to employment equity, you know, a whole sure. tradition to do that. Um, but it's needed because if you have transformative measures, you have to have data. Identities at the national level. Yeah, I think so. I agree. Yeah. So, and I, I think. Data is really the very first thing that the committee looks for. It has made exceptions from time to time, interestingly. For example, Rwanda uh, made arguments about the divisions that the uh, genocide, identification of ethnic groups, a legacy of Belgian colonialism. Um, and there were uh, some exceptions made for Rwanda, but sort of fairly quickly reverted back to requiring data from Rwanda after a small period of accepting that. Uh, the South American countries, Brazil and others, all came up before the committee and said, we're, we're a melting pot, there are no races, et cetera. And the committee just from the 19, as soon as they ratified, started requiring data. And many of them, after a period of time, do begin to report on data. Uh, and so it's been a very successful approach the way the committee has sort of gathered or, or encouraged states to look and provide data. But some countries like France uh, remain, remain a very, provide a very legal argument that they don't, um, uh, that they won't, they won't change. Yeah. Um, in the time we have, I'm just going to close, I think, with uh, a look at the interstate cases, which I mentioned, um, because they're not happening under other UN treaties, uh, really. 11 to 13, um, there were three. These are the only ever interstate cases for a UN treaty body. Uh, Qatar versus Saudi Arabia, Qatar versus UAE, which was about the blockade of Qatar by its neighbours. Uh, Qatar eventually dropped these cases at about the halfway point because of, there was a sort of a diplomatic resolution there. Palestine versus Israel is happening now. It's gone through further advance than any other interstate communication. Um, third, Article 3 is on apartheid. And so uh, apartheid is really at the core of what that interstate communication is about. Uh, CERD was the very first treaty 
to condemn apartheid. There's since been the apartheid convention. There's since been the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which includes apartheid as well. But Serbia's very first treaty with a prohibition on apartheid in its Article 3. So that's one to watch. I think there's a lot of interest there. For the purposes of racist hate speech, Article 4 doesn't come up in Palestine's communication, interestingly. It's not part of it. It's really focused on other articles in the treaty. Um, Article 22, which I haven't really talked about, but it's called a compromissory clause. So if there's a dispute under the treaty, that can be referred to the International Court of Justice. So the ICJ in The Hague can receive a dispute under this treaty. Uh, not every treaty has this clause. It wasn't in the ICCPR again, not put in there, even though drafted in the exact same time period. Um, and many states issue a reservation to Article 22 as well to ensure that the ICJ cannot. Uh, so, uh, for example, Palestine versus Israel. Israel has a reservation to Article 22, so Palestine can't bring its uh, case of apartheid before the ICJ. India, China, etc., also have a reservation to 22, but Russia doesn't. Uh, and that's where the first cases arose under Article 22. Um, Georgia versus Russian Federation, Ukraine versus Russian Federation, Qatar versus UAE went before both uh, because Saudi Arabia had a reservation, which meant only one could go before uh, the ICJ. And most recently, Armenia versus Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan versus Armenia. So um, all five, all five of these um, Article 22 cases that have gone to the ICJ have raised Article 4. So all of them. Uh, Georgia versus Russia, failing to condemn all propaganda and all organizations which attempt to justify or promote racial hatred and discrimination contrary to Article 4 in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So that was about Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, and they said violations of Article 4 by failing to pro or promoting racial hatred. Ukraine versus Russia, which is uh, still before the courts, by the way, but it was before the recent invasion. It's about Crimea. Uh, it's really about the Crimean Tatar, Tatars. Um, Russian authorities are pursuing on the Crimean Peninsula policy of cultural erasure through a pattern of discriminatory actions, including um, uh, and Qatar versus UAE uh, about uh, broadcasting hate speech and false statements uh, arose in that communication. But Armenia versus Azerbaijan and what some consider the counter application of Azerbaijan versus Armenia, they are two separate cases, but they quickly, one quickly followed each other, have both raised issues of Article 4. And uh, in my view, I think have um, uh, some significant um, Article 4 racist hate speech elements to them. So I'll focus on one, and I don't mean to sort of pick sides here. They're both, uh, they're both uh, separate cases, but I'll focus on Armenia versus Azerbaijan, which was the first one. Um, Armenia argues... Azerbaijan's president Aliyev actively uh, leads uh, these practices, routinely uses derogatory terms to collectively describe Armenians. During September, November, 2020, armed conflicts referred to Armenians as animals, claimed Azerbaijani military was driving them out like dogs. Azerbaijan's Ministry of Defense announced the production of military drones, formerly emblazoned with the words Iti Kovan or dog chaser in Azerbaijani. Azerbaijan's opening of a military trophies park in Baku in the aftermath of the conflict is a testament to the pervasiveness of anti-Armenian sentiment in Azerbaijan and a continuation of its anti-Armenian policies. The park features purposely caricatured mannequins of Armenian soldiers presented in degrading and humiliating positions with exaggerated armenophobic features based on anti-Armenian troops. So um, hate speech by Azerbaijani's, Azerbaijan's president uh, in, in the, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict uh, and the opening of this military trophies park in Azerbaijan were all raised by Armenia before the International Court of Justice. And when you go to the ICJ, you can get what are known as provisional measures before you get your decision on the merits. Um, so I'll, if I can just jump, I'll show you the military park, if, yeah, if it works. Um, Uh, so this is from a BBC, BBC article. So uh, um, this is April 2021. So this is Azerbaijan's controversial war park. They're the Armenian soldiers in, in, in this open air museum in Baku. Uh, you can see there uh, the sort of, uh, and so, um, and here uh, we see a, a rejected by Azerbaijan said that the right to, Armenia said was aimed at publicly humiliating the conflict's casualties and prisoners. This accusation was rejected by Azerbaijan which said it had the right to immortalize its victory. So that article is in April 2021. Uh, in um, uh, in um, September uh, of, of the same year, 
Um, Armenia files its case before the International Court of Justice in October. The hearings are held, the provisional measures hearings are held. And in October, the Azerbaijani um, agent tells the ICJ that the military park has been shot. So uh, even in taking this case, uh, Armenia succeeded in getting this stuff out. So uh, it was all Article 4, racist hate speech. It was interesting to see the level at the very top level of international law before the International Court of Justice, violation of Article 4, and even before, years before the court to reach a decision, but Azerbaijan knew they were going to lose this one. So the uh, provisional measures were issued by the court, uh, which would have required the shutting down of the park. And those are legally binding. So we get the third convention being litigated at the highest level of international law and immediate responses to, to, to stuff like this as well that is occurring. So I think what the interstate cases are bringing is a sort of a, a new perspective, I think, on, on UN human rights treaties. Um, but it's not a sort of a, a binding option that is open to all. So uh, many states have a reservation to Article 22, which means that not every state can bring it before the International Court of Justice. But when a state can, it does provide an interesting remedy in terms of racist hate speech that is out there. So um, I'm aware of time. Does anyone have any, any last comments or, or, or questions on this in the last few minutes we have? Questions myself, just to, uh, just to close. Um, Skip the first one, but just the UN Special Rapporteur on Minorities, Fernando Varen, has warned of a tsunami of hate targeting minorities, said it's time for a new treaty that outlines the obligations of states, social media, businesses, and others. So Fernando Varen, Special Rapporteur on Minorities, is talking a lot about hate speech. Um, he believes that we're, there's the tsunami of hate as well. So I don't know if his views have come up in your project, but he thinks we need a new treaty. Does anyone think we do need a new treaty? Is hate speech that bad in the world, or, or is he exaggerating? Not something I understand, but the thing that I do find interesting. Some level, because I mean, obligations are going to be always on the state, that's the yeah. function of them. So to even consider. Because hate speech in itself. Online is now. So yeah. I focus on most scholars or practitioners. Online is, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I do agree because I mean there are perspectives, yeah. So it is, it is, and I mean my you know, my own perspective on this is that we don't because we have surge. So if you if you have a new treaty, who's going to ratify it? You have all yeah. those problems, and it's kind of a big distraction of resources. Yeah. I think a sort of a prudent application of Article 4 in line with GR35 would apply to online, et cetera. But I mean, there's also sort of business and human rights treaties. Is yeah. that something that comes up as well in, in the project that could well, include I, well, hate speech? I mean, actually, I'm not doing that well, but mm. many of the colleagues have. Yeah. I mean, obviously you get the spread of hate through Facebook. India, the spread of hate in India is alarming now. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the spreading of, of messages anti-Muslim um, and, I'm studying anti Dalit uh, sort of um, uh, hate speech has been circulating in India uh, with um, collective violence that has emerged as well in India. And so um, that's what Devaran is sort of drawing attention to, I think. And I think it's significant that a special rapporteur would call for a new treaty, which is sort of a big step. And calling for a new treaty, hate speech one way. I, yeah, good question. And he is a special rapporteur of minorities, so um, I think he's obligations of state, social media, businesses, and others, maybe in relation to minorities. Yeah, I don't know. Should it, should it apply only to minorities? Okay. I think it would include also yeah things. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, I guess that's that's. I mean, as long. Whether it would have minorities in the title or not, I don't think he's necessarily clarified, but that would be my understanding too. Of course, there is no treaty on minorities, but yeah. Was an idea you thought was a good one? I mean, is that something that with currency in the UN? Well, we, we discussed back and forth. I didn't land. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not convinced. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that would be my, my, my as of now India was a big topic it, it doesn't Which is a huge issue in terms of yeah exactly no it doesn't and I've been yeah I'm working on that for a while but it seems to yeah um, Ireland the very last point should Ireland withdraw its reservation to Article Four is there any reason that you keep you would say they should any freedom of expression advocate who would say keep it in there uh, I think they've said that they will although yeah um. I think it goes all the way back to 1963, in my opinion, that reservation. Yeah. So just one thing, I might, I might be a little bit off, but yeah, but sometimes you read reservation where the like we've basically done enough domestically, we don't need to like yeah. if they enter this reservation in the same way they kind of still apply that they've done enough. Um, Australia is also interesting with their, their federal yeah. kind of legislation. Sure. Actually, the different state has different specifically. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if I am on the wrong treaty you now. I might sometimes it's in the other things like ICCBR and Article 20. It's a they similar go, thing, yeah. We don't need to, or we preserve. Yeah. Well, I mean, what they argue is that it's not really a reservation to Article 4, it's just a sort of an interpretation, and yeah. therefore, you know, we do apply to the provisions. So, yeah. There's a lot of complaints of hate speech that are launched by white men. So this is like, yeah. even in the UK, hate crime statistics, and yeah. like hate speech statistics. And so yeah. like without engaging with what racism as a system of power means, whether there could be racism so for, if I may answer just from a purity sir, perspective, general recommendation 35, contextual factors point C, the position or status of the speaker in society. So I would, you know, I would argue that that contextual factor, white men in America have a status, whether they accept it or not. And so that does not mean that they can use or that hate speech laws are sort of necessarily should be on their side. So I think the understanding of Article 4 that is there from the committee itself clearly takes into account that you know, it, it's not designed to protect more privileged members of society. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily sort of a, I mean, uh, I think if there's, you know, there can be, there can be, apartheid South Africa was a majority that was being suppressed. So obviously it's not just necessarily about minority and majority, but I know what you mean. But I know those majority in power, then no, I don't think the, I don't think the provision and I don't think the understanding of the provision in GR35 would ever support that. that. So, so I argue that it's, it is about protecting vulnerable groups within society. And that's clearly there in the contextual factors of GR35 and has always been there in all of the practice of the committee. So I would say no. Yeah. Um, is kill the boys and the boys are there. And started off African farmers called Africa and they labeled themselves as a call to incitement and they feel threatened because they're minority. 
Yeah. Uh, and a line from a creative song, which is. Yeah. Uh, being brought by the public. And in contrast to. The criminal offense to display. Forum, the group that brought this about the fact that you know it's hate speech to display the Africana of and um, the human rights. What do you think the outcome of the case would be? Sorry. What do you think the outcome of the case would be? Um, on, the, on the case on um, Kill the Boer, <laughs> I 